Hello, welcome to Extraordinary Women TV with Shannon Skinner. I'm your host. My guest today is Keely Abbott. She is the owner of Small Wonders Pet Supply Store based in Toronto. She is also an animal welfare advocate, um, and I'm so grateful to have her here today to, tell her, to talk about her story. Later in the segment, before we take a break, I'll have my regular Good to Know Minute when I ask my guests for their top success tip. You'll hear Keely's. Keely Abbott, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Shannon. It's great having you here. Now, um, of course, you, you own uh, Small Wonders Pet Store on the Danforth here in Toronto. You're an advocate for, um, well, creating healthy relationships with our pets. You've also been one of the first to advocate for a raw diet for dogs, director of an Ontario SPCA, president of one of the Canada's first dog rescue organizations, a behavior consultant for canine legislative groups, and a member of Toronto Animal Services Advisory Group, uh, Board, and more, and, and on and on and on. I mean, you've done a lot, actually, for dogs, um, particularly in the city of Toronto. So congratulations. Thank you. I don't know how to sit. People have tried to train me for years. I just can't sit in one place for too long. <laughs> <laughs> now, and then, of course, there's people like me who have a dog who, who are very uh, grateful to, to have had you um, um, as advocates for, for our dogs in the city. What got you so interested in the health and livelihood of the canine species? It, it's just really a natural progression. I wasn't born in Canada. I was born in England. And um, where my parents lived, we were surrounded by horses and dogs and chickens and, and uh and animals there, thereabouts. And it was just a natural progression. As I grew up, I always needed to have animals around me. And of course, moving to downtown Toronto in the 60s and 70s, you can't really have a horse in the backyard. So oh, dogs really. were the next sort of smaller progression down. Let's trace your um, career a bit. I mean, you came to Toronto and uh, you began to train dogs. I started training dogs right. probably as um, late teens, very early 20s, but more, more in my late teens, just as a, as a hobby of my own. And what I noticed from a lot of the dog training classes, which at the time had sort of followed along the old school of dog training, which was force the dog to sit, force the dog to lie down, you know, that sort of thing. And then in the 80s, it kind of went sideways the other way, and there was no balance. It was give the dog a treat, even if the dog is wrong. Give the dog a treat, even if it pees on the floor. I mean, it went completely the opposite direction. There was no balance. And what I started to observe was this lack of balance was really messing up the heads of the animals. How so? And a how dog is a dog is a dog. No matter how hard you try to change it, a dog can never be a human being. It is a dog and we need to respect it for the species that it is, which means we need to learn how its brain thinks, not assume that it can read how our brain thinks. And if you can do that and achieve that, then you can achieve a really, really healthy emotional relationship with the animal whereby it's happy. It's not just feeding them, walking them, dressing them up in funny clothes, giving them everything they want. You know, it's also, there's a balance. There's a balance of, um, how would I say, a discipline, but firm, fair, and respectful discipline, and a balance of freedom that we have to allow them to have as well in order for them to be socially acceptable animals in their own pack world. Now, you have been, I mean, you've had a, a number of remarkable positions. You know, as I said earlier, you've been a director of Ontario SPCA, uh, director of one of Canada's first dog rescue organizations. I mean, there's something in your heart that really connects to these dogs. Absolutely. I mean, people say, wow, you must really love dogs. And I kind of want to iterate a little bit that, that working with, with animals in the capacity that I work with them, absolutely there has to be a love or a passion for them. It's not a love like we think of as human beings. It's more, it's more of a passion. It's more of an understanding of what they are that drives me to continue to learn about them and help people also learn about them in their own way. So now here you are today. You own uh, a very successful pet supply store where uh, I might uh, just share with my viewers that uh, I buy my dog food uh, at your store and all my pet supplies for my dog, Bob. And I appreciate it. <laughs> I have for years, which is how I actually know Keely. Um, well, actually, before that, from, from before the store, actually. Yeah. Um, but let's talk a little bit about Small Wonders and, and what makes it unique. Small Wonders has been in business for approximately 14 years. It was started by Kimberly Azard, who um, was the previous owner of the store. I worked with and for Kimberly on and off between all of these other projects for many years and um, helped to build a, a natural approach to 
pets in the city, which uh, with raw feeding. I mean, you know, when, when we started in the business, everybody was thinking of IAMs and Purina products and things like that. And, and really, these aren't, in my opinion, suitable diets for dogs by any means. They're a very convenient way to feed dogs and cats, but are they really healthy? Are they really what the species needs? And, and neither Kimberly and I believe that at all. And that we started advocating for what dogs actually ate before the advent of dog food. I mean, dog food was not created for the dogs and their health. Dog food was actually created in the First World War as a way to bring dry rations into the field for military dogs because carrying cans and, and fresh meat was unreliable and heavy. So they had to come up with a dry ration that they could tote around to feed these animals while they were serving in the military in World War I. Of course, in World War II, it was perfected. Then after World War II, when the 50s came along in North America, the, the, the sort of you know, mentality of convenience. And so these, these military dog foods fell, found favor with the general public as a way to conveniently feed a pet. Was it really healthy for the pet? Not as much as fresh, fresh food, absolutely not. And it would just actually, when you think about it, it's actually really common sense, isn't it? I mean, it does make common yeah. sense. I mean, the one thing that has changed drastically is um, the way people approach feeding raw diets for dogs. In the last decade, there's been a lot of information out there, and unfortunately, the internet is not always the best place to get information because people can share opinions that don't necessarily have any basis in fact. Um, going to the grocery store and buying ground chicken is not a way to feed your dog. It really does take research to make sure it's balanced. But if you think back to our grandparents, and for some of us, even our parents, what did they feed their family dogs? They didn't go out and get dog food, they, feed, they fed what they were eating at their table. Yeah. Which brings me to another point is our food sources then were a lot healthier than our food sources are now. So if you're going to feed a raw diet or a home cook based diet to your dog, you really need to research the quality of meat, the quality of grain you're buying. Because as we all know, not just for, for us, for the animals themselves, the quality of, of what we're able to buy these days has really deteriorated. Well, you know, as as you know, uh, my viewers may not. I I feed my dog raw raw food, yes, you do. Uh, fifty percent of the time, uh, and the other fifty percent of the time, uh, um, a high quality uh, kibble. Absolutely. Um, and for a lot of people, it's not um, financially feasible to feed a completely raw diet, especially with a large breed dog such as yourself. Or time constraints also um, are very difficult for people because if you can buy prepared raw food diets from pet stores such as Small Wonders, but they are quite costly for a large breed dog. Um, if you're going to go out and make it yourself, you can save a whole pile of money, but you also have to spend a whole pile of time. And for a lot of people with you know, today's busy lifestyle, that's not an ideal situation for them. So they do opt to do both. But the one important thing is they should never be in the same bowl at the same time. Kibble is fed as a separate meal, preferably at night, raw food in the morning, if that's the way the client wants to go with the animal. Why, why is that so important? Raw meat is full of enzymes. It's, uh, raw vegetables are full of enzymes. Um, they digest at a much more quick rate. A dog only has six feet of intestine compared to 26 feet of our own. So it really takes them very little time at all to digest their food. Kibble, on the other hand, is a dry extruded product. All the moisture has been removed from it, and it's basically been power condensed into a nutritious kibble. So if you mix the two together, the raw meat slows down because the kibble takes much longer to digest, and then you'll get fermentation in the gut, which is not healthy for the dog at all. Now let's talk about um, the dog-canine-human <clears throat> bond relationship is something that is, goes back thousands of years. I mean... Tens of thousands of years, apparently. Yeah, in some cases I've read uh, at the very least 15,000 years, if not maybe 30 or even 60,000 years. We're really not sure. We're not yeah. sure. Yeah. But we know it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, and what is that bond between the dog and uh, a human? What is the bond? And, and why is it so important to us and to them? It's really unique in the animal world. I mean, we're animals, they're animals, there are lots of animals in the world. Um, dogs are the only species that look humans directly in the eye. Who knows why? Maybe it's this 10 to 20 to 30,000 year relationship whereby we're guesstimating that wild dogs started to approach camps where people were hanging out, of course, where people are starting to gather there is going to be garbage and there's going to be feces and there's going to be all kinds of nasty things. So garbage piles, we're assuming, started to be built. And these wild dogs would come in for easy pickings, basically. I guess the way we think about it is that the dogs that were softer of temperament or the dogs that were less afraid 
um, the dogs that were maybe a little bit more bold and, and amenable to the presence of humans started hanging around more, coming closer to the camps, coming inside the camps, to which humans then realized, now we have an alarm system built in. Because dogs will alarm bark, as a lot of us know now, some of our little dogs alarm bark a little bit too much, and we wish they didn't. So maybe that was part of the reason that dogs um, came into our lives. And then we just sort of, as, as time went by, as the centuries went by, it seems now that today's modern dog, we, we just take it for granted. It is what it is. It lives in our homes. It's a species that can live with us. Because if you ask anybody who has a cat, you know, they don't own the cat. The cat owns them, basically. You know, dogs have masters, cats have staff, is, is sort of one of the, the things that people say. But a cat will rarely look you in the eye. A cat does what it wants to do. Dogs will always look you in the eye. And because we took them for granted for so long, we never really researched them like we've researched the behavior of other animals. We just expected that that's what they are. Now there's a lot of formal research going on about the modern dog, and we're finding some really, really interesting things about why we bond to them, why they bond to us. And a lot of it has to do, believe it or not, with pheromones, with smell. Wow, this is fascinating. So we'll pick it up after the break, and, which means it is time for a break, and it's my Good to Know Minute. And Keely, I know that you've got a great success tip for my viewers, so jump right in there. Well, I have to say, my biggest tip would be to be transparent. Completely be yourself, especially from my point of view and working with animals for so much. If you try to be something that you're not, you can't fake out an animal. You absolutely can't. So why try to fake out a human being? You know, if you have open, honest relationships with people that you meet along the way, they'll, they'll, they'll um, respect you for it. They'll expect it from you. Treat them how you want to be treated by them. And honestly, that's the best way of being successful in our world today. Not necessarily financial, but most certainly emotionally successful. Well, thank you, Keely. That is good to know. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, more with Keely Abbott animal welfare advocate and uh, pet supply store owner called Small Wonders here in Toronto, so stay right there. Welcome back to the show. I'm Shannon Skinner, and I'm speaking with Keeley Abbott, who is uh, an animal welfare advocate and owns a Toronto-based pet supply store called Small Wonders. Um, and uh, I just want to show a photograph of, uh, of my dog, Bob. Of course, Keely, you will recognize uh, this, this little guy. I guess he's not really so little, but there he is. Look this at is that. That's what you call fun freedom right there. Yeah, That's what him. is a dog. And you know, um, he, this was taken last winter. Uh, my sister was here, and she captured him just in that moment when his ears went right up like a rabbit. So yeah. anyway, uh, it's one of my very favorite photographs uh, of Bob. Um, now, one of the things that you have done for many years, too, is foster care. Yeah. Uh, and you had a special little guy um, in your store that you were taking care of. I mean, Toronto Star did a feature on him. Um, maybe he's even world famous now. Yeah, I think he is actually, to his be honest with you. His name's Turbo, and we do have a couple of photographs of this little guy. So some of you, uh, certainly based in Toronto, may be aware of this little guy. Uh, what's yeah, his that's story? Turbo. What's his story, Keeley? Turbo was a little dog. See his um, wheels there. His yeah, wheelchair. he's in a wheelchair. Uh, a little, uh, sort of moderately sized terrier that was um, uh, part of the Tales from Greece rescue organization, who uh, Small Wonders helps along with a lot of other rescues throughout the year. The lady who runs Tales from Greece here in Toronto uh, brings in dogs from Greece and adopts them out into Canadian families. So she had been passing around information about this little dog that needed to come to Canada very desperately. He was uh, very emaciated, he needed medical care, he, was, um, he had spinal cord injury, and he needed to get to Canada, get a wheelchair. And the reason that the people in Greece who were sheltering him were so adamant about him was because of his personality and temperament. He was a little dog who wouldn't give up. So with the store being laid out the way it is, my husband Brian and I thought, what a great place for a dog to learn how to use a wheelchair. Plus, Lots of people can come and visit him because the store is open to the public when, during our business hours and hopefully we'll be able to find a great adopter for him that way. So Diane flew him over, we started fostering him. He turned out to be a lot more than we'd expected. Talk about personality plus. We had to name him Turbo because the second we placed him in his wheelchair, he literally took off like he was turbocharged and he never looked back since. He's been adopted to a wonderful family in Brighton. He actually lives outside the city now, Leanne and Greg, and uh, he's just doing fabulously. 
maybe he'll walk again. We don't know. He did have spinal cord injury. He was actually hit by a car and tossed in a, uh, in a dumpster. And somebody picked him out of the dumpster and realized he was still alive. And as a segue to that, we're actually now, because of our success with Turbo, we have a second dog through the Tales from Greece Rescue who is a little, looks like a poodle mix, same color as Turbo, also wheelchair bound, but this one will probably walk again. This one was shot and basically kicked around a lot, so a lot of damage to his back legs. Um, and uh, he's from the same town. So even though they look completely different physically, they have a lot of personality similarities. And uh, words kind of going around that maybe the new dog, who we've named Skids, Little Lord Skids. Skids, I love short it. Short for Skidmark, because of the way he drags himself along the floor when he's not in his wheelchair, um, might be Turbo's brother from another mother. Well, isn't that a small world? Small we don't wonders. know. We can only guess. We like to, we like to kind of think that way. So that's how we're going to play it from here on in. Well, I had the pleasure of meeting Turbo um, and seeing him before he went to his home. So he was uh, a, a cute little guy. Congratulations Thank on your you. success. Uh, uh, you know, he he's in a good place now. Well, that's the thing about dogs um, yeah. and talking about why we bond with them so much is that they don't judge. They live every day as today. They don't remember yesterday. They can't physically remember what happened to them yesterday, unless there's a trigger that might bring back a memory of something that occurred to them in the past. And they certainly can't figure out what's gonna happen tomorrow. They can't even figure out what's gonna happen a, year, a, a minute from now, to be honest with you. Dogs live in the now, and we can really learn a great lesson from them for that. They, they get joy by just being. Um, so whether they're wheelchair bound, Turbo doesn't remember when he walked, his muscle memory remembers how to drag himself around, but he couldn't care less if he had four legs or two because he's quite happy to be who he is right now. Now, um, of course, it, one of the things that we wanted to cover today is uh, having a healthy relationship with your pets. Um, well, this is so important. So I know that you've got some, some tips. So yeah. I know one of them is to treat, and you, you touched on this earlier, to treat your dog uh, for the species it is. Exactly. Respect it. Whatever you do, do not treat your dog like it's a person in a fur coat because it is so far removed from that you can't even possibly imagine. It does them a great disservice to think of them as human. Even though they look at us in ways that we perceive as being human, they're not at all. They're, they're, they're dealing with us and their brains are working in a way to try and understand us as dogs understand things because let's face it, they're dogs. The second thing is to never anthropomorphize your dog, which, which also leads in from that first question. Um, they don't get jealous. They don't um, judge. They don't have vindictive qualities. You know, these are not qualities, even though they may seem like I come home and there's poo on the floor and he does it just to spite me. Dogs are not emotionally, mentally capable of that train of thought at all. And research is really proving this now. Dogs can only behave innocently as dogs do. So all dogs chew, all dogs poo, all dogs pee, all dogs bark. You know, it's, it's learning to live with them as, as they understand the world is the most important thing to do. And lastly, top quality nutrition, top quality education for yourself will benefit the dog and uh, top quality health care basically and especially preventive health care that means proper exercise that means if you have a border collie going to the park and throwing a ball mindlessly is not what your dog needs tip number four is if you're going to get a dog get the dog that matches your personality and lifestyle not the dog you think is the cutest because the cutest dog could end up being your worst nightmare if you don't gel emotionally or physically or with the dog's needs, you know. Um, if you're an elderly person who is fairly housebound, wants to watch TV, a Border Collie is definitely not your choice in a dog. The dog will go mental and you'll be frustrated for the dog's entire life. You know, something slower moving. As we were talking earlier with CK, used to have a Bull Mastiff. So Bull Mastiff is a great dog for an older sedate person. Even though it's a big giant dog, it really, it, it's happy to get up when you do. You know, there are, there are over 250 sort of popular dog breeds and mixed breeds uh, thereof out there. Um, so always pick the dog that matches your, your lifestyle, your personality, your temperament, not the cuteness factor. Of course, uh, reference to C.K. Gray. Um, that was during the break we were, we were chatting. She was talking about her bull mastiff. Um, anything else? There's some great tips here. Well, dogs also bring a lot of social um, and emotional benefits to people yes. by just the nature of them getting us out into our communities and by the way I, I found a stat in 2001 there were 400 million dogs in the world and yeah. as of 2010 
77.5 million dog owners in the U.S. I didn't find any Canadian stats, yeah. but uh, in the U.S., that's f almost four, that's 40 percent home owners have a dog. Have a dog. At least one. At least yeah, one. Exactly. And yeah. unfortunately, that also leads to a lot of dogs being abandoned, which is why shelters and rescues are always overloaded. But that's a completely other show. Right. Um, for people that are happy with their dogs and, and, and they're, they're committed to their dogs and their dogs are committed with them, going out into the community, dogs force us to do that. And here in Toronto, you know, if the slow, snow is like blowing sideways and it's minus 30 outside, you have to take the dog for a walk. It's not negotiable. So out there, you'll inevitably meet another snow-covered human being walking their dog as well. And inevitably, a conversation will strike up between the two of you. You're both in the same neighborhood. Dogs bring us an incredible sense of community. There's a lot of friendships and even relationships that have been created by simply walking the dog in the park. So dogs not only give us emotional um, uh, feedback to ourselves, they get us giving feedback to the people in our own community and in turn strengthens that community and also makes that community safer. Because where there's a dense dog population in any urban community, there are less break-ins, there are less um, you know, assaults on the street, and dog owners are out there 24-7, 365 days a year. So they're always community eyes in the neighborhood as well. And don't I know that one? Yeah, <laughs> yeah the first thing I do before I come to the show, of course, I've got my dog out there. Absolutely. So, so yeah. dogs are great social lubricants between human beings as well. Because the conversation will turn to dogs. Usually, you know, how's your dog? This is how people break right. the ice. What was your dog's poop like this morning? I mean, let's face it. If you have a dog, you talk poop. It's just the way it goes. True. You get right down to the basic essentials of life. <laughs> and it breaks the ice between people because it's a yeah. comfortable conversation. It's not an uptight cocktail reception conversation like, what are you doing this weekend? It's, oh my God, my dog had messy poop this morning. Really, so did mine. Totally breaks the ice right off the bat. Well, Keely, I'm afraid we're out of time and I really enjoyed this conversation and uh, you were so inspiring for all that you do for dog owners in, in the city and in the country. So uh, thank you for that. Thanks, Shannon. Um, appreciate your time. So how could people reach you if they wanted more information or some advice? Well, they can come to the store anytime. Myself and my staff are extremely well educated and knowledgeable in all aspects of health, welfare, and, and behavior with the animals, both cats and dogs we specialize in in the store. And um, you're on the Danforth? On the Danforth, Danforth and Broadview. You can also reach us through uh, our email, which is smallwonderstoronto at gmail.com. And our little outdated website, I'll be looking into this, which is uh, smallwonderspets.ca. Well, thanks again, Keely, and uh, wishing you all the best. Thanks, Shannon, you too. Well, for more information about upcoming shows or to contact me, you can visit the website at extraordinarywomentv.com. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, lots of places to, to find me. Very, very special thanks to Cindy Miranda, who's been my assistant um, behind the scenes with Extraordinary Women, and she's also been my right-hand person in my company, Skinner Publicity. It's her last day today. So thank you, Cindy. Well, if you're interested in transforming your life, I hope these stories have inspired you. You've been watching Extraordinary Women TV with Shannon Skinner. See you soon.